there's two. Uh, well, the ones you did are the same thing. There's a bit, ah, right. So there's this, um, right. Okay. Sorry. I'll try and carry it. No, I, I should have taken a belt or something. But yeah, it's quite heavy, so I won't risk it. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, so so I'm, I'm a postdoc at the University of Reading, and I work with Martin and also Ben Harvey um, on the interaction of uh, storm tracks and the large-scale flow. And today I would like to talk to you about some of our recent modeling work that I worked on uh, also with Paolo, our favorite collaborator. <laughs> and uh, so let's get started. Maybe I'll be stationary with this work even. No, that doesn't work okay. It's okay, I can use the cursor, it's fine, it's all right. Uh, so, so the main uh, kind of motivation for this work that studies storm tracks and the response to thermal and frictional forcings is uh, there, are, there are two parts to it. One part is the is climate change so in the future, storm tracks, as Martin showed in the morning, are predicted to change by uh, latitude and also magnitude. And the response itself is still quite uncertain. And uh, so here I included a map, uh, a plot from Lehman et al, who looked at the future changes in CMIP-5 models um, in the eddy kinetic energy, so how strong our storms are. And in the black contours is the climatology, and the shading, the colored shading, is the response in the future. And what you can see from this plot is that the storm tracks on average are supposed to shift poleward, and also in longitude, for example, the uh, uh, North Atlantic is predicted to be more extended over Europe. And so, yeah, so there's one part of the motivation is the climate change, and the second is the fact that the model, the models that we use to diagnose climate change are still, still have large biases. And the only way we can understand these biases is to look at the underlying dynamics, and that will tell us how we could improve, for example, the parameterizations of the gravity wave drag and uh, convection, whatever you, whatever you want to focus on. So, first of all, we wanted to look at uh, this interaction from the point of view of a simple-ish hypothesis, and so. We, we chose a nonlinear oscillator model that Martin presented this morning, um, which basically describes the interaction between the, the storm, storms within the storm track um, and the large scale flow. So uh, I won't go into the details of the model since Martin already described it, described it quite nicely this morning. But basically this model is a two dimensional model so we have S is the large scale flow of thermal wind, baroconicity, whatever you like to call it. And that's forced by, uh, say, thermal forcing and decreased by some uh, eddy activity. And then we have another equation that describes the eddy activity uh, change, and that's forced by this uh, uh, interaction between the uh, growth rate times the heat flux, and it's damped linearly in this case. Uh, so this this uh, system has two types of forcing, if you like. There's the forcing of the baroconicity, which provides the energy into the system, and there's the dissipation of the energy, which is via the eddies. And this is an oscillator, as we saw this morning, and just to remind you that you, you can plot this in a kind of phase space for a different amplitude of these oscill oscillations. And, it's, oops. and if you were to look at time series of the North Atlantic, 
and average them in this phase space, then you get a nice uh, agreement with the model. So great. So we've got we've got a high, we've got a simple uh, model that uh, describes the very basic dynamics involved within storm tracks, and we managed to uh, recover this behavior, at least on average, uh, in the in the observed data. And this actually works um, in idealized models and in the Pacific. So it, see, this circulation, circulation seems to be um, a general property of the system. And so, okay, so we've got this hypothesis uh, that in the time, so, so we, we can use this model to look at the time mean behavior of the storm tracks, as Martin mentioned this morning. And that this model predicts that the eddies will respond to the forcing of the mean flow, not the forcing of the eddies. And the mean flow, the baroclinicity, will respond to the forcing of the eddies, not the forcing of the baroclinicity. So this may seem to be quite counterintuitive because, yeah, like I said, if you, if you imagine our system, you've got a kind of forcing of the mean flow, of the large scale flow, sorry, and this interaction with the, with the baroconic eddies, and you force this bit, and you don't get a response in this bit, you get a response in this bit, and then vice versa. So, okay, um, it's, it's actually not um, a surprise that this side of the mechanism is the case, or is predicted to be the case because um, in the atmosphere it has been observed in models and also to some extent in observations. And this is a process called baroconic adjustment and it's based on this idea where if you try to force your storm tracks uh, or the baroconicity, so if you try to increase the temperature gradients, then yes, instantaneously the baroconicity may respond, but that then gives rise to activity in the eddies, which will then start eroding the temperature gradients, and so the baroconicity will be maintained at some critical level by the eddies. So then, no matter how much you try to force the baroconicity, the, the eddies are the ones that respond. And there's this uh, idea of eddy saturation, which is pretty much the same idea, but uh, it's, um, that's a term used in oceanography. And so there's this other side of the, of the predictions, which is about friction. So if you dissipate eddies, you should be changing the growth rate of eddies, so the baroconicity, rather than the actual eddies themselves. So this relationship is difficult to test in observations because you, you, you have a limited time series and diagnosing uh, fr f the response to friction and thermal forcing may not give you a very, uh, very robust signal. And so we decided to look at this mechanism using a hierarchy of models. And so usually when people talk about hierarchy of models, they, they think about the numerical complexity of models. So you might have, for example, the difference between Speedy and the Open IFS. Speedy has um, I don't know, eight vertical levels, it has some simple parameterizations, and the Open IFS is more, has more sophisticated parameterizations, more vertical levels. So the people usually think about the, if, if you were to set these models in the most realistic setting as you can, how, how uh, realistic uh, is the output? But in fact, you could use these complex models in a simplified setting as well. So there's two types of complexity, and we are using these type types of complexity to develop uh, an understanding of this, uh, of, th of this relationship with the storm tracks. Um, and it's, hopefully you'll agree with me that this is quite an efficient way of doing it, because what you could do is to take Speedy and just run it as an aquaplanet model with no storm tracks, nothing, and see, see what it looks like. Then add a rectangular force heating like Paolo was presenting, then add continents, and then, you know, 
then, then look at the output. And then you could move to the next complexity of uh, models, so say the open IFS, and do the same thing. But this takes a lot of time and a lot of computing power and storage. And so it's actually quite useful to move along this line. So if you, if you go from the very, very simple models, add, th then when you move to a more complex model, such as, I'll actually do this, such as uh, a Heldens or RS, I don't know if you know this. Well, let, let's just say Speedy, because you, you're familiar with Speedy. So if you move to Speedy, then you're not only increasing the complexity of the model, but also the complexity of your setup. And then if that doesn't work, then you can go back to your simpler model and move in this direction. But there's no point in moving in this direction and increasing the setup to the very, very complex setting and then, you know, filling out the matrix uh, one by one. So, um, so yes, so we're using this hierarchy of models and we're using, we have our simple nonlinear oscillator model, which I'm calling the AN model, like Abraham Nowak. And so <coughs> we then testing this relationship in a model that's based on thermal relaxation and Rayleigh friction. So that just means that your forcings are very, uh, well, very, very simple and there is no moisture. And so, yeah, so, so that's the next step. The next step will be speedy, which has for example, moisture, and it's more, uh, for example, has the uh, radiative scheme and uh, convective scheme. And then the open IFS, which is even more complex. And uh, then we can have a look at the CMAP5 models later. So today I will talk to you about, uh, so this is still work in progress. So first of all, uh, let's have a look at the Puma work. And so we have a model that, uh, whoops, it's quite cost resolution. So Puma is a, 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 a dry dynamical core of the Reading IGCM, or it's based on that. And it's, for, it's, uh, it's forcing, it's diabetic forcing, is parameterized in a, quite a simple way. So you've got a relaxation of the temperature, re linear relaxation of the temperature towards some kind of a field that you defined, relaxation field. And then there's some hyperdiffusion, which you don't have to worry about for now. And then there's the, uh, the friction. Uh, this is divergen divergence and vorticity. Uh, so, so they're both damped linearly as well. And the time scale by which you damp the, these two variables, you can divide into the mean and eddy. And because we want to test the dissipation of eddies, which is what the nonlinear, the uh, kind of I, uh, our simple model is uh, predicting that the, the paraclinicity should be depend dependent on, then we're only changing the time scale of the eddies. So we're leaving the we're leaving the friction of the uh, mean flow as it is. And so, as you might imagine, if you apply these, so, so if, you, if you apply these forcings globally, then this uh, relationship absolutely does not work. So, and the reason for that is that in the tropics, you get a response uh, in the static stability. And so this is just an example. So if you increase the eddy friction uh, by a factor of two, then you get this uh, tripolar structure in the static stability. And uh, similarly, if you increase the pole to equator gradient in the, <coughs> well, if, if, you po if, you, if you try to force the pole to, pole to equator gradient, then you will get an increase in the static stability in the uh, in the equator wood well in the tropical region so <clears throat> this and this is the reason why the Hadley cell is the most dominant response of our model <coughs> so this is showing the stream function uh, meridional stream function 
and the anomaly is in, in, is in the colors. So the uh, Hadley cell strengthens as you increase the eddy friction and also as you increase the uh, thermal forcing. And this is not really what we want because if we go back, uh, if we go back to our, mod our very, very simple model, then that doesn't care about Hadley cells or any spatial, uh, any spatial variations. And so, so what you have to do is to try to separate the, by, by having this hierarchy, you can, you get a perspective of what you need to change in your model. So um, you need to isolate the forcing of Puma only to the extratropics. So we did this by applying a weighting function for both the thermal and frictional forcings so that only the extratropical regions were affected. And what that did in terms of the friction, so this is again the example where you increase the friction by a factor of two, so the colors are the response. So the isolation of the forcing to the extratropics only, you will get this tropical uh, response in static stability is gone. So that's good. And that's associated with uh, a very different response in the Hadley cell, which doesn't seem to respond at all anymore. And the main response is in the um, <coughs> kind of storm track regions in the mid-latitudes. That's good. And in terms of the uh, thermal forcing, uh, use, if, if you, again, isolate this uh, thermal forcing to the extratropics and the polar regions, then uh, the static stability response seems to just, in, in the tropics, seems to disappear, which is quite good. And again, that's uh, associated with uh, a very different response in the, in the global circulation. So the Hadley cell is, again, unaffected. And that's great. You've seen this plot this morning because uh, this Having, having isolated the, the forcing to the uh, mechanisms that you are interested in has now made a very, very simple model, uh, has, has, um, what's the word? has justified a simple model in, in, the, in the GCM. So the, the model, the model predictions are, have been are, are true. In, at least in this simplified setting. So great. So really, the, as you increase the eddy dissipation, the, it's the baroclinicity that responds and not the eddies, whereas every, as you increase the forcing, the thermal forcing, which is supposed to force the baroclinicity, it's not the baroclinicity that responds, it's the eddies. And okay, so by, by having this hierarchy, of models, we were able to kind of revise our experiment and go back and improve it so that we could test this mechanism in a more uh, reasonable way. And so the next step is to look at Speedy, which Paolo, the setup was introduced by Paolo this morning. So it's basically a heating triangle in the mid latitudes, which produces a localized storm track. Uh, you can look at the storm track uh, in terms of the heat fluxes. So the reason why we chose this setup, actually, is because it produces a really nice tilt in the jet. And these models, these aquaplanet models, are quite known to produce very zonal storm tracks. So having a tilt was quite special. And so, yeah, here you can see the, in the colors, the low-level wind is really tilted. And if you look at an, an animation of this, it, you can see it nicely flips about just like it does in the North Atlantic. So, and in time, Martin showed this morning that uh, the speed it seems to emulate the behavior in the North Atlantic and in the very, very simple model quite well. So, okay, that's good news. So we wanted to use this setup, since, it's, since it works so nicely in the time varying picture, 
we wanted to see if in the kind of time mean picture it also works. And so on the right here is the speedy um, is, is the speedy experiments compared to the Pima experiments. And the model runs are still quite limited. We like I say it's still work in progress. Um, but you can see that there are, apart from this annoying red line, there's a, there's some th there is some hope. I think there is some hope that uh, that these patterns will be similar to these patterns. Having said that, if you look at the speedy response, if you look at the spatial maps of the response, they are a lot more complicated. There, there's more complex, especially around the triangle. There seems to be um, perhaps unre unrealistic structures when you force it with uh, the friction. So that's kind of a problem. So we, so I went back to Puma and tried this uh, triangle experiment in, in the simpler model. And I get the same structures. So now I'm trying to um, design a different, ex uh, different forcing, so to dif create a different uh, storm track, if you like, using a heating dipole instead, instead of the triangle, to see if the if if this if these unrealistic features can be uh, eliminate, el eliminated from the model runs. So, yeah. So that's the so this so this is where we are so far, and the plan is to. When we when we have a good speedy uh, result, then is then we want to move to the open IFS, and the open IFS has a more realistic planetary boundary layer, and so we wanted to see how how these uh, kind of you could say simple ideas how how they apply to the very complex and smaller scale circulation features, and yeah. And eventually, we will look at climate models, and this is this, like I say, this this hierarchy of of models, so it's, is a real time saver because you don't have to do all the all the experiments in each, of the, all the experiments in complexity in each individual model. So, yeah. So, do I have time still? I don't know what time it is. Yeah. Can I can I just go over the conclusions or? Is it time? Yeah. So there, there's a so we found a relationship in a very simple kind of conceptual even model, which which shows uh, that if you force the baroconicity, you get a response in the eddies, and if you force the eddies, you get a response in the baroconicity. It did not uh, even at first it did not seem plausible, but a, there seems to be quite a bit on the literature, uh, in the literature on the baroconic adjustment area, uh, on the baroconic adjustment idea, and then we looked at it in the model, and it seem, seems to work. And it's not just a model uh, property because we tried different types of models, and we tried different complexities of models, and this is a very good approach to kind of. If you can't look at this in observations in, in long time series of uh, I don't know climate models, then using this uh, hierarchy is a very good and efficient way of uh, being able to tell whether they, the, whether this is a property of the system. And our next step is to look at this dipole storm track in Speedy, and uh, also look at the open IFS for more realistic. Uh, features of the forcings. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.